Hey Grinder School, this is Code Red Rules. Today we're going to go over some hand histories involving 3-betting and playing in 3-bet pots and uh, in the replay here at, at Heads Up 100 NL. And then these hands should be relative to all stakes of Heads Up play and maybe even some in like 6-max blind versus blind play. But that is not what we're going over right now. We're just going to go do some hand histories. So let's go ahead and get started here. Um, the very first one we have is with Ace Jack Offsuit. Um, I can tell you right now, this is very early in session against this, against this opponent. Um, we have no reads on him. We have no idea what kind of a player he is. Um, and so we're pretty going to play this uh, a fairly standard way. So what's this quote-unquote standard way to play in a 3-bet pot, I guess I should. This is, what, this is how we play that, play this hand. Um, we raise it on the button, which is what we're going to be doing the majority of the time anyway, like well, maybe... 80% of the time or more we're going to be raising the button. So relatively according to our range, ace check offsuit is a very strong hand for us. It's a very top end of our range. It's a very good value re-raise. A uh, value raise, I'm sorry. Uh, and so when our opponent re-raises us to 9, we have no idea what this is going to mean. Um, he could be doing this as a bluff. He could be doing this for value. He could just be doing this just to be doing this. And not really know he could, could be pushing buttons. Um, so we really have no idea how to play against this guy. So should we 4-bet here? Or should we call or should we fold? Well, I mean, obviously this is very top end of our one of the very top end of our range hands, so we're not going to be folding. Um, and if we four bet, four bet folding in this spot would be pretty gross. I mean, I would hate to turn this hand into a bluff by four betting and having to fold. Um, we have no idea what his five betting range all in is. You know, if we find out later that he's a complete maniac and this guy re-raises every other hand and he five bet shoves you with like ace five then yeah, then we're definitely going to be 4-betting here and getting this in. But like I said before, we don't have any reads. And so the standard play in this spot is just to go ahead and call, and we're going to and hope to see a good flop. We are getting 2-1, to one, um, and we are 2-1 to one technically to hit a pair on the flop. So we're getting even money on our odds. We don't need to hit too much post-flop. Um, chances are, if he has... Like, we have him out-kicked with a jack. If he has queen-jack and king-jack, with, which is something that a lot of players do re-raise with for value, uh, myself included, and, you know, we're flipping against, like, under pairs and stuff if he has, like, 10s, 9s, and 8s, which a lot of players, again, re-raise with for value. Um, and we'll at least get, like, 1s through to value from 8s, 9s, and 10s. You know, most players are not going to be check-folding, like, a jack-high board when they have pocket 10s or pocket 9s. They're at least going to be able to, like, give 1s through to action. Um, and so the, the really only biggest problem would be if we flop an ace. And if we have, we'll have, like, top pair, third kicker. Probably the worst board would be, like, ace... 10, 9. Um, that wouldn't, it wouldn't even be that bad of a board. Like, in terms of, like, an, an ace, because their kicker would be kind of, wouldn't be that great. But it would also be okay, because on a 10, 9 board, king jack and queen jack are going to give you a lot of action. Alright, so what we, do, what we do decide to do is to go ahead and call. And we flop pretty well. We flop, uh, we flop top or top kicker on a, on a flush draw board. Um, our, the stack to pot ratio at this point is roughly four. At fold, if we were to fold at this point, it would be a pretty bad play. So, like, if he bets, he, he would probably bet, you know, anywhere from 12... A standard bet in this spot for him would be $12 to $15. If he did bet 12 I probably would be more willing to call and then uh, raise and getting it all in on the turn. And if he bet 15 I probably would just go ahead and get it in right now. Um, there... There isn't that much difference. Uh, obviously, if we call, we let the uh, a heart get there, which, um, you know, it's actually a double-edged sword in that spot because if we are ahead of top heart of kicker, and let's say he has a hand like jack-9 and he'd give us action right now, um, if the heart comes in and he doesn't have a heart, he's going to be more willing to go ahead and check fold um, or slow down whatever hand that he has. Uh, contrarily, though, if he has a hand like uh, ace of hearts, king of hearts, or ace of hearts, uh, king of space, something like that, and, he, and the turn comes a heart draw, and he has the, the nut flush draw, he's going to have a hard time letting it letting that go. So we're going to get action from his flush draw still. Um, I'm not worried about him having the flush draw all too much in the spot. Um, if he has the nut, if he if he ends up like hitting the flush on us in a re-raise pot, then it, it is kind of it is a cooler, and I, and I consider it such. Um, so and the, or the only two scare cards that I could really worry about would be like king a uh, king and a queen. And Queen Jack and King Jack would both be willing to get us getting it in on this flop. The only difference would be that we would get it in ahead on here, whereas we'd get it in behind on the turn. Um, 
and I get you know if the king or king comes, king or king king or queen comes. I'm sorry. Then our opponent could have hit like a you know top pair with an ace queen or ace king, but that's really you know three outs, and that's going to happen only roughly uh, six percent of the time if he does have a hand like ace king, and so it's a, actually it's not a bad risk to take if if he know, if he's known a two barrel. Um, however, he didn't see bet in the spot, which as soon as he does that, then I then I have a very good guess that I am way ahead. Um, the only thing that we should ask ourselves is, is should we bet here or should we, should we tuck behind? Um, we have top or top kicker. We should not be pot controlling this in a re-raise pot. You know, we should not be afraid that we're going to get the money in behind. Um, we should be willing to bet this and getting this in. Um, if he if he does check raise us, he's going to have a mixture of kind of uh, draws and maybe marginal hands that needed the extra value of my bet in order to give him a little more EV in whatever play that he's making. Um, uh, and by that I mean, like, let's say that he had, as a bluff, um, nine, nine, eight of hearts in this spot. Um, so he would have, like, a gut shot and a flush draw. Uh, and a very good draw at that. Now, if he were to bet and get raised all in, he would end up having to call off all, all his stack and well, and he'd have to do that because he's getting the correct odds to make that play. Um, however, let's just uh, let's say that he's going for a check raise here, and I were to bet twelve, and he check shoves me all in, um, and it's going to be fifty dollars for me to call, and I'm not, I'm only getting like not even getting two to one on a call, so I would not be able to get it all in like on a flush draw. Like if I had a better flush draw than he was, um, it, it would be really it would be hard for me to play. So. You know, him check raising a draw in this spot, especially like a, a non nut draw, well, even the nut draw too, you can do it, it's fine. Um, it gives him that extra fold equity and it gives him more money in the pot um, in order, uh, so that way, whenever he does, like, it might get me to fold, then I he wins more money in the long run and it gives him better odds to, to hit his draw. I'm not saying that I like a check raise here with, uh, with like, 90 to hearts, although I t totally see it and I do see it, like, when. Instead of betting out, like usually the standard play for for really aggressive guys or actually any player, is to not slow play too much. They slow play a lot and um, with like the nuts. So if he had like pocket sixes here, pocket fives, I could see him slow playing. But if he had pocket aces, most players are just gonna go bet, bet, bet and get it in. They don't want to like um, have the, have the chance of a free card to to, uh, to suck out of them. Now if I had a hand like uh, Jack Ten here. Or Jack nine, or Jack eight, um, or even like eight seven offsuit. If I end up flopping like the uh, open and start draw, I wouldn't be betting in this spot. I'd be pot controlling it back one. Um, and it's not like that I'm willing to, like that I'm not going to be f that I'm going to be folding my hand like Jack ten ever in this spot. Like um, barring some like backdoor heart draw coming in, I don't I don't have a heart. I just wouldn't. I would play it in such a way that it gives him the most opportunity to bluff me. So I've gone ahead and ran it down for a few minutes about how I would play certain hands and how he should play certain hands on this board. But what actually happened? Well, he did, in fact, check to me, and I did bet 12. At this point, the pot is actually 17 and 18 because there's a rake in the pot. Um, I want to give him the impression that he has some kind of fold equity over me. I have a feeling that I'm way ahead, and I don't. I, I, what, what am I worried about here is, like, queens, kings, and aces, and, you know, we're in the first couple hands of the session, so if he ends up flopping... An overpair to my top pair cup kicker, like three hands in, um, then good game, and I'll get, you know hopefully he sticks around and I'll get the money back. You know you gotta you gotta you gotta admit to some coolers every once in a while. Um, now he shoves me all, he actually you know, he doesn't shove me all, but he check raises me half a stack, which is essentially like a shove. Um, and in fact, I think he if he he would have more fold equity here if he didn't shove. Uh, I don't know what I would ever call him with in this spot. I say that because you know I'm only getting I'm getting three to one on a call, so it's not enough to call on any draw. Um, too much, so and I really don't have any fold equity on a draw, either. The only hand that I would continue with here would be a hand like uh, you know any jack I'd get it in, and any nice combo draw, so like the ace high, the ace high flush draw, um, or any kind of gut shot flush draw or better. Um, so. I guess I have two, like three plays again. I could fold, which, like I said, after flopping top or top kicker in a re raised pot, SPR four, uh, we're not going to be folding uh, top or top kicker to an unknown. Um, so folding still would be a, a pretty bad play. 
Uh, we could call, and calling wouldn't be a bad option. Gives him a chance to put the rest of his money in on the turn. Uh, we don't want a scare card to come and ruin our action if we are ahead. And he's going to assume that if we do call here, we've got a hand, and we probably won't we won't fold the turn if he shoves. So he might like he might actually check fold the turn to us. And so I think the best place is just go ahead and get get the money all in. Um, I remember re raising back. And he goes as and calls, and he shows me the ace queen offsuit. Um, it's not a good play at all, very early in the session. Um, in fact, if I if I'm him, I actually check call this flop. If I don't want to see about this, I'm afraid to see about it because I don't think that my opponent's folding anything ever. Um, then I might actually check call it and continue to play this pot out of position and probably give up on another barrel. Oh, excuse me. Check raising doesn't really do too much, though, other than guess turn your hand face up. So you know, I think believe you do. I do believe we hold on this. As we're only dodging a queen. All right. And so that that is how to play like top bear top kicker, a very standard way to play it in a re-race spot versus kind of an unknown player. Um, we're going to come back with a another hand history, so don't go away. Hey guys, and we're back again. Uh, this time we are again in position, and we again have a decent top pair type hand, a king jack offsuit. Our opponent is rather aggressive at this point, so folding this hand to someone who's three butting us uh, a lot of uh, with a, with a very high percentage is not a very good play. As he's three betting hands like jack ten or you know, king seven or just all kinds of random crap. That um, if we uh, we call him and we can hit top pair a lot and we'll get our stacks in pretty good. Um, so let's go ahead and you know let's just go ahead and go through the hand. So I raise the three x in the button. We get re raised up the nine x, which is a very standard uh, play that it goes on a lot. Um, and so we go ahead and decide to call. And we fought pretty good. We fought uh, top pair good kicker here. Um, we're behind of the three hands: king queen, king ten, and um, ace king. Uh, that's relatively like ace king and king queen are at the very top of his range. So I tend to not think that he's that he like ever has it. Um, when somebody's three betting you like thirty or forty percent, that uh, how often they actually have like a real hand like ace king is 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 very small. Um, so I'm more worried about maybe like king queen and, and king ten more than anything. Um, it, if and so, uh, what's our line going to be? What's going to be the best line that we can take? Um, should we, if if he see bets here, should we raise and get it in? Uh, we're obviously not folding this hundred big blinds deep. Again, I said the last, I said that if uh, you know we call pre flop with a decent top or type hand, flop top hair, good kicker or something. I guess an aggressive guy folding hundred big blinds deep usually is not a great play. I say usually because there's always probably going to be at least one play where you can make where you can fold it but I tend to not make that play and I usually just try to get it in um, and I try to get it in the most plus EV possible too um, so we're gonna go ahead and judge what his at reaction is if he checks to us we're gonna bet um, we also like to bet here a lot with as a bluff if we find an opponent who re-raises and then check folds the flop um, we're gonna be calling him probably we'll probably start calling him with like almost every time with a uh, re-raise and then just bet whenever he checks to us if he does it a lot. Uh, but he does decide to, uh, he bets out 12. So like I said, we can decide to raise him up to 36 here and or maybe even like 30 or 28 or on those lines. Or we can call and see the turn. Um, the only big, the only scare card that I'd be afraid of would be like an ace. If he has a hand like ace queen or ace jack. Um, but he'd be, if, he, if we raise him here, the, the probability that he's going to continue with ace queen ace jack is very slim uh, and so we're we're looking at roughly let's see if he has ace queen we lose to the king I mean, sorry we lose to an ace and we lose to a jack so probably anywhere between like six and seven outs between whatever hand that he has and that's going to happen about 10 percent of the time um, we also have the jack of diamonds and the jack of diamonds is a very important card for us because if the third diamond hits on the turn um, we have I, I like to call we we, we kind of have a uh, a a backdoor a backdoor flaw draw. So if he did end up re-raising with the sweet character like nine eight of diamonds or something like that, um, and we turn a diamond, that's going to give us another 
street, or we can suck out another street. To, so we have a lot of equity, I guess I should say. Um, so I do tend to like to call here in this spot. Uh, if we flop two pair, I will probably will raise two pair up and maybe attempt to look like a flush draw. If somebody's re-raising me a wide range, I'll be raising a lot of draws and trying to get getting them in. Just because, like, if somebody re-raises you 30-40% of the time, chances of him having, ever having, like, top pair is, is very slim. Um, and we're going to have a lot of fold equity, too. So uh, we go ahead and just call here. And when we call on this spot, it isn't to fold the next street. We if we will slow down if like an ace comes and maybe a queen comes, but um, that would be about it. Any other card, we're gonna be looking to jam on this guy and just get it in. Um, even a diamond, so don't don't be afraid of a diamond either. Now if it's like the queen of diamonds, um, that's one good thing about like uh, having king jack in the spot is that even if we like, even if a queen does come and our opponent has ace jack, uh, you know. And if it's like the, if the Queen of Diamonds comes, we have like the Royal Flush draw. So as long as he doesn't have the Ace of Diamonds, you know we're doing okay. Um, obviously, there's a lot of combinations out there that will hit like a Queen or or whatnot. And if he has a hand like Queen Jack, he's gonna have a real hard time folding Queen Jack on the turn when he hits a pair and the open and the strike draw, even though he's drawing dead or drawing to sweat the pot. Uh, okay, so our our plan here: we call the flop at and we're gonna ship any turn. Um, there's our diamond. Um, we're not afraid of it too much, you know. I, as I said in the last hand, that like now he's going to be barreling us with like the Ace of Diamonds. You know, if he does have the Ace of Diamonds and like any other X card, if he has like Ace Eight with the Ace of Diamonds, he's going to be betting it again. Or it's a really good two barrel card for him if he has like a higher diamond. Um, and so we have a couple more options again. We can either call it or we can ship it in. I think the pot's really too big right now to try and see if we can eke out an extra true value from him. He's going to be calling us pretty lightly in this spot. If he has, like, ace-10 with the ace of diamonds, he's going to call, like, pretty much any pair and a good diamond, he's going to call us all in. We don't, we don't necessarily have the most equity against the hand range either. And there's so many cards that come on the river that could really either spoil our hand or give us a reason to fold, and we don't want to look for that. So our plan here is to just ship it all in and, you know, hope for the best put them all in, and he folds. So, as you can see, your opponent does have kind of a wide range. Um, I don't mind him folding in this spot. You know, obviously, uh, we had him beat, because he's not, I don't think he's ever really folding king-queen or ace-king here, or aces or any set or anything, or at least he shouldn't. Uh, but it's just pretty much the way that we can maximize our value. We get two streets of value from c out of him. We give him the chance to, like, stack off pretty lightly. Um, and, you know, we win a big pot in the process. Alright, so I'm going to go ahead and come on to the next hand, and I'll be right back. Okay, so our next hand is going to be another fairly common situation that you guys are going to find. Uh, you're somebody who likes to min re-raise you like every freaking hand. Um, and to be honest, I don't mind those plays, because I actually have a feeling that like most players play pretty bad in 3-bet pots. Even myself, I mean, I, I play much looser through the pots than maybe I probably should. But that's only because my opponents play worse than I do. Um, and so when I find somebody who, like to, who likes to min re-raise me, um, I'm willing to never fold, like, probably any hand that I have. It's a really good spot for him to have value. But keep in mind that they have a hard time adjusting to my widen range. And so they feel like that I'm a little bit more aggressive than I really should be. Um, so that's what happens here. I... Uh, I make it 3x, and he makes it 5, and this is a very standard situation. We're getting 4 to 1 in a call. Uh, it would be or it would be very criminal for us to fold pretty much any card in the, any hand in the situation. Um, just keep in mind that we're looking to flop like a really decent hand, like 2 pair, uh, a nice flush draw. Yeah. But we're, that doesn't mean that if we flop a jack or a 3 and it's like a bottom pair or a second, third pair, that we're folding it. No, because like if someone is min re-raising every hand, He's only going to be hitting a pair also, one and three. Um, and he's going to be paying, he's going to be giving us some value with his air hands a lot. And so we have to learn how to play these kind of hands um, in position. So uh, we go ahead and call. The pot's going to be $10, or mine minus the rake. And this is a very common very common spot when you're calling re-raises with a hand like jack three, is you're flopping like middle pair, no kicker. You know, how do we get value here? Is there any value to get, and how do we play it? 
Um, if he checks to us, I have a feeling... Uh, well, we really don't know, because a lot of these players, when they min, when they min re-raise us, they check like 100% of the flops. And that's even better for me, because I'm in position, and I can, and I can determine whether or not I want to bet, or I can check behind and get a free card. If I have a gut shot on the flop, I usually check behind and look for a free card. Um, and so, same thing goes for like if I have like middle pair or bottom pair. Uh, so if he checks to us here, I'm going to be checking behind. There's not much value with the ace on the board. He's going to be like uh, pot controlling ace x a lot. He's also going to be slow playing like ace king a lot too. So there's a lot of reasons for him to check. Uh, not very many reasons to bet unless he's got like a complete air kind of hand. Um, so uh, what does he do here? He bets a like, half pot, five dollars. Um, it's the same size he made. He made preflop. Uh, you know. I'm not really willing to fold his hand just yet. Yes, the ace is out there. Yes, we may be beat. But folding any kind of like pair on the flop to such a small bet, I think it's going to be pretty criminal. If my if my opponent like, potted it here and made it like 15 or something like that, I might just let it go just because uh, I don't want to deal with the high variance that call might make. And you'll also find that if someone who min re-raises a lot and they see it a lot, they tend to have nothing a lot too. Like... Some of these guys have such bad reads where it's like they'll only check to you and they actually flop a hand. And they'll bet pot when they don't have a hand. And they'll bet half pot when they have like a hand but not a strong hand. Um, and I don't know if I have that read on this guy or not. I'm not saying I do. But when you see somebody who min re-raises you every hand, that's something to keep track of. Don't just sit there and call and then you know get frustrated post-flop when like, he bets every time. Or he check calls when he when he checks to you, so whenever he does check call, he has a hand or whatever so along those lines. Uh, just determine like how he plays, and then you'll be able to adjust to him and beat him that way. Uh, so we call, and uh, that's another reason why we can call is because we will hit two pair, and we'll will suck on it. So we're getting three to one in a call. We're let's assume that both our jack under three are going to be outs, and that's roughly five outs. So ten percent of the time. We're going to be hitting our uh, our our two pair. Um, it's on top of the times we're already ahead. So if we're behind, ten percent of the time we're going to go hit our card on the turn. Uh, he's also going to be like checking checking to us a lot of the turn, so we can get maybe get a free card out of him. And we're we're getting three to one, and that's roughly twenty five percent. So uh, we don't need to make too much value when we do hit two pair. Um, he will have the ace some, a lot of the time, or sometimes here if he bets again. And we'll just get we'll get value out of him that way. So let's see what he does here. We're raising this we're raising this turn getting then, especially with the uh, the stacks in the pot the way they are right now. He bets six. Um, yeah, we can't really let him draw. I mean, he's gonna have like a diamond draw sometimes here too, and he's just willing. He wants to like see a cheap river, and we're not gonna let him do that. So we raise him at twenty four. I don't know if I like this raise size too much. I think uh, let's see. What's the what's the, what's the say that he does have a flush draw in this spot? Uh, twenty six plus forty would be like a sixty six divided by five would be like a twelve dollar raise. Um, I do like making it like eighteen or twenty here over twenty four. I think eighteen would be just fine, um, but that's not what we're arguing about here. We're just trying to raise it up and get it in, and uh, he comes all in o over the top of me or almost does, and he calls it off and he has the mighty like third pair. So I don't know what he was doing on uh, the turn here, but uh, I benefited by it, and we end up taking the pot down, and we end up hitting a boat too, our completely unnecessary boat. So okay, that was how to play like in a min re-raise pot, middle pair kind of hands. Um, we're gonna go on now on how we're gonna play a couple draws. Okay, so in this situation, we're going to be playing a draw in a re-raised pot. Um, and there are going to be different set situations and different ways you want to play a draw. You'll either want to uh, raise the flop or call it or maybe even fold it. Who knows? All right, so this opponent likes to re-raise us fairly small quite often. Um, he's also known to uh, barrel or see bet a lot and pretty much bet at every, every, uh, every instant he can. Um, so keep that in mind. So we're going to go ahead and raise, and uh, he goes ahead and raises at seven, and we're getting like two and a half to one. Um, he does it so much that like we 
don't really need the implied odds to make this call. As a matter of fact, it's just that, like we're going to hit the flop a lot, and we we're able to play in position against them a lot in a re-raise pot much better. I'm not saying it's the greatest call in the world, but it's I think it's not a not a bad call either. So we're going to go ahead and uh, call the four dollars. Um, if you made it nine here, I probably would fold, uh, unless we were like both really deep. Um, we we hit a lot of nice draws with this hand. I mean, that's not as nice as like eight seven suited, but we hit a lot of like pair and gut shots, and which give us reasons to float. And we're gonna we're gonna if we hit a pair, we're gonna be good. At, we're gonna be good a good percent of the time also. Um, we flop on a very dry dry board. We flop uh, an open and straight draw. And um, if he checks to us here. If I've never seen him check raise, I might fire it out and I might check behind. I might do it with like an equal frequency uh, of both. Uh, he he does bet roughly like pretty small comparatively. And when uh, and uh, this is thirteen dollar pot after the rake, a normal sized bet here would be like ten or eleven. Uh, when most players re raise pre flop, when somebody makes an eight like this, it's usually a you know they're either slow playing like a monster hand or. They've got. They've actually got a marginal hand that they're willing to fold to a raise with. So it's a, a very polarized range, um, and it's very hard to hit a monster. So it's more likely that he's got a very marginal hand. Um, since this guy likes to bet a lot, I'd rather try and like bluff him off a hand here because he's not going to give me good enough odds on the turn given the stack size to go ahead and see my equity all the way through. Um, Granted, you could call here sometimes, and I sometimes again sometimes I do, and I will show you guys a hand after this one where I do decide to call the flop with the draw instead of raising it. Um, but against somebody with an extremely wide range pre-flop, and who likes to see bet a lot, I'm going to be raising him here because we're going to have a lot of fold equity, and um, we're also going to have a lot of equity in general. Like when he wakes up with like a six or a five, you know, there's a good chance that we're going to have two overcards plus the open and straight draw, and that's going to be a favorite. Against whatever kind of hand that he has, you know, if obviously if he has a hand like uh, Ace Ten or or even like Ten Eight or Ten Seven, uh, we're pretty dominated. But that's pretty unlikely against uh, with this opponent. So we do decide to go ahead and raise him up here. What's a good raise size? I usually like to make it like three X. Um, I think twenty four here would be a little too high, although that's what I did. I made it twenty three. I almost think like twenty one and twenty two would be just enough. If he shoves us all in, we would get we would have the pot odds to call. Uh, so we're not we're not going to be raised folding. I actually don't like raised folding and re-raised pots. I, I mean, I don't. I'm not a big fan of it. I do see some players do it against me, and I don't really understand it. Um, so when I raise in the spot, I kind of expect him to think that I'm not ever folding if he shoves. So if he does shove me here, I actually think that I'm only going to have the minimum 33% equity. So I would need two to one to call, but if he does shove, I'd be getting like two and a half to one on a call. So I'd have to call. That's all that rant was about. So uh, I do decide to raise him up here, and what's my standard play going to be? Like if he calls me, like obviously if he folds, it's good. If he calls me, I'm going to be checking behind most turns if I don't hit if he checks to me. Um, we're going to have like roughly a three quarter size pot pot bet left, so that's why I made this raise size, um, and. You know, if he sho if he decides to shove me on the turn, I don't hit my straight. Then fine. You know, we give our ch chance us uh, we give ourselves a chance to win the hand without uh, having to see a showdown with like a draw. And if he shoves on the turn, then he's gonna have his beat, and there's really not much we can do. So I make it 23, and he does call. And I don't mind him calling here because I have a feeling that like if we do hit our hand, it's gonna increase the likelihood that we get paid. Now, granted, like uh, it doesn't make the re-raise um, as profitable because he does call. But uh, lucky for us, we, we we hit our straight on this turn, and he and he shoves into us. Um, I only don't know what I'd be raising with on this turn that I would now fold uh, to this shove. Maybe a hand like um, seven four or something like that. Because if I had nine eight, I probably would float the flop more than raise it. Um, if I had any ten, I'm going to be raising it, and I'm not going to be folding to this bet either. And any overpair, I'm not folding. So I don't know what he's trying to represent other than like the eight seven himself, which is what I do have. Um, so I snap him off, and he shows me ace five. So not only did I have like uh, two overcards, and you open a straight draw, um, he only had bottom pair and like top kicker. Now, what were to happen if that was instead like an eight, and he shoves? I'd have a hard time folding, um, to be honest, or even like a seven. I mean, 
we would have most of the time if he does shutter he's gonna have like a two pair type hand of which I counterfeit. Uh, like if if a turn comes to seven, he's gonna have like seven six and seven five a lot. And me having seven eight gives me a lot of outs. Like any any you know, the open and straight draws come, I have outs, the ten comes I have an out, or my eight comes I have an out. Um, so I have a lot of outs even against if he has a two pair hand. So I would probably call it off and you know, I would hate my life, but uh, I would still make the play. And he's drawing, he's drawing dead, so I'm obviously holding it and getting it in all in with uh, the perfect equity. So uh, that's that's what an instance when I like to raise a draw. But what about when instead I'm like to calling a draw instead of raising in a re-raised pot? We'll, we'll get to that right after this. All right, so this time we we're we we're up against another player who likes to three bet us a lot. And we're, we're going to get a good price preflop, uh, at least we should. Um, otherwise, I don't know if I like this call. But I've played a lot with this guy, and so I've got a lot of his right him. So he he likes to re-raise a lot, and he and he likes to bet a lot. And I, that's the kind of the guy who I like to. Um, but he what he doesn't do is he likes to bet the flop, but he doesn't really barrel too much. And you can see this stat by going like holding a manager, um, seeing like how often he fires continuation bet. And then seeing how often he fires a turn continuation bet, um, like someone like this guy would be like c betting um, over three quarters of his hands, and then uh, checking the turn a heck of a lot. Uh, so we're gonna go ahead and uh, you know play in that quarter. We know that like we're we aren't necessarily the the shallowest here, but we're also not that deep either. So if we fought like a top pair king with the uh, with, with you know that it, we're probably gonna be playing a little bit more pot control than we normally would than if we had a like king queen. Um, if we flop top pair with the seven, we're gonna be more likely to play that pretty fast. All right, so let's go ahead and get on with it. I make it three, he makes it five. Again, these guys love to min re-raise. God bless them. It's I love calling here, hoping to flop a good hand. Uh, the flush draw is pretty much as good of a hand as I can ask for. Um, I have a feeling I I pretty much have like a right to steal this at any time. Um, if I feel like I'm gonna get my opponent to fold, so I, I not only will I hit this like flush draw a whole lot, but I'll also have like my pair draws are probably gonna be good against someone who re raises a lot, and so I just see myself winning this pot a lot <laughs> when I when I see this flop, and I get disappointed when I don't win it. <laughs> All right, so he goes ahead and uh, makes it nine out of ten. Now, actually, it's nine and a nine because the the uh, the rake was in, taken out, so it's a pot size C bet. That's pretty large. When someone makes a large seal like this, it's another reason why I don't like to raise. Uh, if we make it like 27 here, I mean, he gets his all in. Chances are we're just going to have the flush draws outs. Whereas if we call, there's a, a good chance where if we hit a 7 or a king, our hand's going to be, our hand's going to hold up at showdown. Now, what would happen if he made it like $4 here instead of 9 I would go back and forth between whether or not I like to raise. If I've been like raising him a lot when the only donks, um, then I probably would raise here too, just to uh, kind of build a pot and kind of put him on tilt. I don't think he's. I don't know if he's going to fold or not, but uh, it's a spot where I would sometimes raise if he bets weaker. Uh, partly because I have I have the equity too, and I don't mind him folding. But since he's bets pot out like this, I'm going to go ahead and call and hope for a good turn card. And I do. Uh, this is actually like, one of the better better turn cards. Uh, it brings another like top card out of hand. He's gonna have a hard time folding, and you know obviously it gives us the flush. So we're gonna try and get it in right now. If he checks to us, we're gonna bet probably 21 here, maybe maybe even like 25, and then probably over shove the river. Um, or we could go maybe go 21 and then. Uh, 50 on the river with like 20 behind. Maybe try and get him to call. But either way, we're trying to get this in. And even if like a fourth heart comes on the river, we're probably not going to be folding to whatever bet that he makes. Okay. So he instead decides to like overshove this turn. I have no idea why, but it's a good, really good reason. A really good, uh, you know, we we pretty much give ourselves odds. You know, he gave us the odds to call and draw to the flush, giving us even two to one. So. We go ahead and get it in, and he actually makes a weird fold. He's getting three to one in a call, 
So he's if he has like the Ace of Hearts, he's almost getting the right price to call with like the Ace of Hearts. So, uh, what am I getting? I'm getting this in like more than just like the, the flush. So I'm getting this in with like Queen Jack and any other two pair or set that I have. Um, maybe even like uh, ten to the ten of Hearts. I don't know. I might full ten to the ten of Hearts, but you know, obviously over pair like top pair uh, Ace Jack with the Jack of Hearts. I probably would get this in here. Um, Maybe a, a, the Ace of Hearts with a pair, I would get it in. So there's a lot of hands I would get this in with. But he he does decide to fold, and uh, I go ahead and take a nice pot down. Um, uh, so I'm going to go ahead and find another hand history for you guys, and I'll be right back. Okay, so the the first five hand histories or so w had to deal with us being in position in the re raise. Uh, facing a re-raise. Now let's go over a few hands here where we're the ones doing the re-raising. Um, so we have an opponent here and like your typical you know heads up opponent, he doesn't like to fold. Um, he So he raises a lot and he calls re-raises a lot which makes making King Jack a very easy re-raise for value type hand. Um, we flop a lot of a lot of good situations where we can either see that profitably or you know flop top pair and get our stack in profitably. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, my opponent min raises me uh, on the button, and he does this a lot. And actually, a lot of players do this a lot. And I don't really mind it. I actually probably play more out of the blind facing a min raise than a lot of players do. Um, so in this spot, I like to re raise his hand, uh, make it eight to go. And as a good good shoulder does, he goes comes in and calls. So uh, select part ratio just a little bit over five right now. It's a pretty good spot for us to have when we have this hand. All right, so uh, we flop top pair, pretty good kicker, but pretty nasty board. I mean, we're dodging a lot of cards. We're dodging, you know, potentially like an ace coming, um, and obviously any diamond since we don't have the diamond. Uh, against an aggressive opponent, we're going to be wanting, we're going to be willing to get this all in on the swap. Against someone who's extremely passive. We're not actually willing to get in on this flop. He's, if he if he like min raises us here or something like that, and somebody who's a, who's not known to raise any flops, he's he never really folds a C bet, but he never really raises one either. When he do, if he does raise here, um, it might be a spot where I'm willing to let it go. But that said, that's another story. But what should we do? Well, uh, we have a couple options here. We can either bet or we can check. And I think checking would be the worst possible line. The last thing we want to do is give any free cards in this on this board. And so we're going to bet, and the pot's actually 15 minus the rake, so uh, we can bet anywhere between, you know, two-thirds a pot of 10 or full pot of 15. Um, if I had, I might actually, I might actually in this spot determine my bet size based on what kind of hand that I have. Um, I might actually bet a little bit weaker with a hand I'm going to want a two-barrel for as a bluff. Maybe if I bet like a nine here with the ace of diamonds. Uh, then uh, let's see if I had ace queen with the ace of diamonds. I would bet maybe nine here, so I can put a bigger bet or have a two bar out there that would be uh, a little bit lower risk. Um, however, with king jack here, I probably would be more willing to just make it eleven. And if I had like a set of fours, I might actually make it fifteen just uh, to charge my opponent to, to play. Um, so I make it. I should make it eleven. Yeah, I make it eleven, and he calls me. And, you know, praying for a good turn card. If fourth diamond comes, I probably will check fold it, and there's not much to do. Um, but it hit trips now on this turn, and my goal right now, barring any diamond coming on the river, is to get it all in on the river. Um, so I need to bet enough that it will both, A, like, give him incorrect odds to draw, as well as um, make sure to build the pot here. So I'm looking at probably around the $30 range. Um, I think I make it like 31 which is just fine because uh, look how much is behind. You know, we have 51 behind. It's like a half pot river bet. But if, when, if he does decide to call this, and again, we can't check here ever uh, just because we don't want to give him a free card to anything. So we're pretty much forced to bet call it off um, if he does raise us. But he decides to to call us again, and again, I'm not. I'm not actually too worried about our hand right now. I feel like what he's got, he's either drawing to like the the flush with incorrect odds, or he's got like a nine 
with like a heart or a nine with a diamond, which is drawing just to the flush again. Or he's got a jack when we've got him out kicked. He might possibly have a diamond too, but chances are that if he does have a jack, he's probably going to be raising us on this turn, even if he does have a diamond, because that's what I would do. Um, and if he had any other hand, uh, you know, if he does have the jack, I'm not really too worried about it either. So, like, what do we do on this river? You know, it bricks out. He's either got, like, a misdraw, a nine, or a jack. Um, or I guess you could have, like, aces, kings, and queens also, but... Um, and it, which I think aces, kings, and queens would have to get in on this flop. The the jack, I'm going to get my money in either way. You know, if I shove all in here on this turn, he's he's either going to shove or I shove. And so now the question is, like, how often does he, like, bluff a missed draw here? How often does he get to the river with the miss, with the draw? How often does he bluff the missed draw? And compared to how often will he call, like, this half pot all in? Um, if there's a chance that he'll call you with, like, ace-9, which there's always that chance, I actually do like a shove. Uh, same thing goes if he has, like, queens, kings, or aces here. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and just try and get in, and he's going to have a hard time folding, getting, like, 3-1 to on the river um, for a half-pot shove. But uh, I shove, and I actually did think about it later, if maybe check calling would be the better play. But I actually do think I like shoving more than check calling. Not that I'm afraid that, like, he ever has the flush. It's just that, like, I just don't think he ever bets anything on this river that isn't the flush all too much. Although, he might bluff it. I just don't know how often he has the best flush draw to make this play. Um, but, you know, it turned out for us. We did win a big pot, and it was a pretty scary board. And anytime we can win a big pot like this, I'm going to be pretty happy. Uh, Alright, so we're going to go on to our final hand of this video. Alright, so I kind of misspoke. It's not in our final hand. We've got one more hand after this. But th this is an opponent who is a very aggressive, raising nearly every button and calling nearly every three bet. So this is the kind of guy that I will re-raise eight pocket eights with pre-flop uh, just for value sake alone. We're so far ahead of his range when he calls our when our calls are re-raised that we have to make this play for value reasons. Now, there are going to be a lot of bad boards for his post-flop, you know. Most of them are going to be bad boards more than not. But we're going to be able to make up for the fact because their opponent has such garbage hands that we're going to be able to play pretty well on a lot of flops. And, you know, if he outflops us, he outflops us. So uh, he makes it four to go, and I make it 12. That's uh, my standard re race size when somebody makes it this, this large. You know, it's going to be like 3x normally. And you know, we'll go from there. It's a pretty big, it's a pretty big re race size. He calls us off. And we've got SPR of like three and a half. And obviously I'm looking for an eight uh, or an overpair. You know, I, I'd appreciate either one. All right, uh, this is almost as good as I can get, you know, without it being, there being an eight on the flop. I can't ask for much better. Um, it's all a matter of now, like, how am I willing to play this? You know, am I willing to stack off on this board against this opponent? Yes. Okay. So once you figure that out, it's a matter of, like, how do we get that money in correctly? Checking in this spot would be pretty bad, and only because if we check raise, it's gonna look kind of fishy. I don't know what he would call what he would bet call off with on the on the flop here. I don't really know what I would ever ever have in my bluff check raising range, uh, even though you probably don't need to be thinking about that kind of stuff against this this opponent. But in most scenarios in this situation, if I'm c betting my complete air or my missed or my other missed hands that I three bet, then I'm gonna be um, c betting also pocket eights are pretty much all my value hands too to make up for it. So I'm going to be going ahead and uh, betting what's like 17 uh, and you know he calls me he calls us here so he's either got like an over pair nines or better he's got some kind of like drawy hand like a gut shot to a four maybe like seven eight or something he probably would raise seven eight on the flop and or he's got some kind of like pair of like a six a five or a two or pretty much anything um so he calls it off, and not a very good turn card comes. You know, it's, it, it pairs the top pair on the board. However, we're we're pretty much committed at this point, and we're also in a pretty awkward like stack situation where he's got like one a little over like one pot size bet left. So, and if we do decide like overshove here, there's a good chance he might only call us with like a six rolling off. Um, 
if we have a read that earlier in the session where we three bet preflop, C bet he calls, and we check two one on the turn, and he bets, uh, it's a, it's good to remember the situation because now is a good time to take advantage of that, and that's exactly what we do. Uh, I don't mind him checking behind because I feel like that if he does have a pair, uh, I'm gonna be able to get that one through the value out of him on the river. Um, whereas, and if he has a six, you know, if he has a six, it's, it's a cooler, and there's really not much I can do if he gets like a you know, a five outer on me. I, it's hard to put him, you know, on a six or any kind of like hand in general. So, when when a, when a scarecrow like this hits on the turn, you kind of have to go with the flow, and uh, hopefully you you have the best when he gets it in. So I do decide to check to him, and earlier in session, you know, I made the read that he will call the re raise, call the c bet, and then bet the turn. Um, think to yourself this question: like, what in the possible world would he be betting this turn with? Um, with leaving himself so little stack behind, uh, and you got to think about like his entire range at this point, not just like hands that can beat you or the hands that you beat it. Like, if he's calling a lot of re-raises pre-flop, he's got a really wide range going to the flop. Um, the flop doesn't hit too many people, but yet it will hit uh, some hands. And you know, it only really makes sense that he bets this much at this point with either like pocket nines or better. Or like a six, uh, I, or I guess like a boat. But that's actually a very, you know, very small part of his range. He can, he can also still have like a five going to this turn, as well as like a two, as well as like a, like a lot of draws. Or he could just have a complete error and trying to bluff me off whatever hand that I have. So given that I would play it this way with like a lot of my missed over cards that I'm three betting for value with, um, I'm really, it, it'd be really hard for me to fold any kind of hand that's actually made hand right now. Uh, so you could check call, uh, or I guess, your, I guess your your lines here could be the fold, the call, or the raise. I already described why I don't like a fold. Um, calling here is kind of weird because it puts like $22 behind. So I have a feeling that whatever he bets he bets here, let's go ahead and raise and we'll get it in. And we'll go ahead and, and uh, maximize our value that way. And uh, he calls and he shows me the mighty... Uh, he actually instant call at this point. I actually thought that like I was crushed because he had a six, um, but no, he, he actually only had a five, and I ended up taking the pot down. Um, I don't like his turn bet at all with the five, and however, if he did bet the turn with a five, he would actually, it would make a lot of sense for him to call the all in because I'm also check raise, um, check raising all in like uh, a couple flush draws here, like maybe like seven eight of, seven eight of clubs or. Ace King of Clubs. Um, although obviously check raising the Ace King Clubs here would have like no fold equity, so maybe I'd actually prefer to barrel that or just overshove it. But there's also a good chance this guy already made up with in mind that he flopped the hand and he's not going to be folding anything. Uh, but that said, you know that's this is actually a very common line for a lot of like marginal top pair kind of hands where it's like you bet the flop, he calls, uh, relative scare card hits on the turn. And so then you go for the check raise and give yourself a little bit more EV instead of just going bet, bet, bet. All right, so now we'll be back for our final hand. Okay, to uh, wrap up here, we've got one final hand. And we've played against this guy uh, previously, as you have uh, I've already showed you one hand history where he re-raised us. Um, this guy is a pretty big donk. He likes to raise a lot in the button, and then he, but he'll call like, pretty much any re-raise. Um, and he also calls a lot of flops, so he doesn't really ever fold any C-bets any time, which lets me value bet pretty thinly against him. Uh, he's up on me a little bit right now, but that's going to have that's gonna change by the end of his hand. So uh, he makes it to uh, a min-raise, and he min-re-raised us before, I believe, and so min-raises... Well, some of these guys can't really find more than just like the min-bet button, but... That's fine, like 9 is well ahead of his calling to re-raise the range, so we have to re-raise it for value. Uh, so we make it 8 to go, and uh, he calls us, and, uh, you know, the king, we're not really loving the king out there, but like I said before, like, the probability of him having a king in this spot is just as likely as him having like, any other hand, because he's calling us with, like, any two cards, and he's going to be calling the flop with, like, any pair, any draw of any kind. And so I'm going to be very easy. I can actually uh, value bet my nines here. Uh, so I had to make it 11 to 15, and he, and expectingly he calls. 
The uh, pot's probably now like 36 with that after the rake. Uh, and the 10 comes, and I'm not too worried about like that 10 helping him out too much. Um, I'm more... You know, I'm, you know, if he has a 10 in this spot, then it's kind of like, uh, wow, you're, you are a big donk and you suck out on me, but... Um, can we go for another street of value, though, is the thing that I'm wondering. Like, if we had queens here, I might try and go for the second street, although queens I'd be more, comf more comfortable to, like check calling with. Um, if we had like any king, we're going for three streets here. Um, but nines, we don't want to put ourselves in a situation where we might have to call a big river bet, so we don't mind him you know, checking behind, getting, getting a free card, because we can actually fold. But So we check to him, and... Uh, he bets like half pot, I guess, and you know this is actually a really tough spot. I remember like time making at the table about this. It's like we have a gut shot and we have the nines, um, and I think the fact that if we didn't have the gut shot here, uh, it'd be a, it'd be a lot harder to call, just because the gut shot gives us an extra like four outs. It's almost like three times as many outs if we are behind. Um, but the thing is, like he's got like so many pairs here. He, he technically should only be betting a king in this spot, um, or in like two pairs and stuff, and I guess like polarize that with some draws. But he's betting like so much garbage in the situation. Like he's turning a lot of made hands into bluffs here that he really shouldn't, because the players just play that bad. That I can check call here, and you know, given that it's only a half a pot, and I have a hard time folding when the bet's only that small. Like yeah, he's gonna have the king here sometimes. He's also going to have a misdraw, and he's also going to have like a weaker pair than nines. Uh, so I do decide to call him, and the river is a really nice card for me, but I, there's only like a pot size bet left, right? So I'm going to get like 60 behind. If he were to shove this river if I check to him here, I would be in a really sick spot. I probably would have to fold it. Um, even if he were to bet like 35 in the spot, it would be a real sick spot. Um, this is a spot where you look at one of those holder manager stats. How often does he bet the river? Um, luckily for me, I think this guy doesn't really bet the river all too much. And so, like, one of those guys where he only gets, like, maybe one, two streets of value out of top pair. Uh, so that if he does bet this river, it's going to be pretty polarized. Uh, but I couldn't really see myself any other, other player other than just, like, check folding if he were to bet again. Unless it was, like, some ridiculous size bet, like, maybe $10, $15. I guess I'd call that just... just Partly to see what he has, and, and I'm, I was getting a, I'm getting a really good pot odds price. So I checked to him and uh, hope to God that he doesn't actually bet, and uh, he obliges, and uh, he ends up showing me like eight seven. Uh, and like I said, like I said before, these guys turn a lot of made hands in the bluffs. I mean, there's not much value for him to get there with the seven. Uh, maybe if like the river went a check too, he could maybe bet that seven. But I think with his line, I prefer like checking the turn and maybe inducing a bluff out of me on the river, uh, rather than like trying to protect his hand against whatever hands I have. Because I think, to be honest, I'm gonna be check raising him a lot, and with like my marginal hands, maybe like uh, some nice fancy draws, I'll check raise him. He's actually gonna have to fold his hand, whereas, and yeah, he bets it to try and protect against whatever draws that are out there, but. To be honest, I probably would be more willing to bear all my draws against this guy than um, check call him on the turn. But, uh, well guys, that's going to be the end, end of the video here. We've gone over several hands. Uh, hopefully, uh, you guys have you know learned a little bit. You know, playing in three bet pots and and uh, heads up is a very key is is a very key skill to learn and in fact it can roll over to other games like playing through the pots and uh, full ring and six max you, you start to learn to put players on ranges uh, you start to determine what kind of a what what a person is three betting you with like is he three betting you with ace 10 or is he doing it with uh, like 10 five uh, is he doing it for value and, and a bluff or is he doing it like um, you know a mo a more like a more for, I guess I could say just all for value, or is he doing like only the top part of value and then the bottom part of a bluff? I mean, finding out all these things are going to help you out in all your games, and it's, it's much more concentrated in the heads up game because you'll find some players that just like three bet the heck out of you. And so, learning how to play in these three bet pots 
is going to be a key skill. And consequently, there are going to be guys where you're going to want to re-raise them very lightly just because they call you with so much garbage that you can, that you can 3-bet them for value fairly lightly. Um, and therefore, you'll be able to play against them in 3-bet pots too, out, out of position. So hopefully this this video, you know, it's been pretty basic, you know, playing. Give you, I showed you guys some good lines. Um, hopefully you guys have learned something. And, you know, if you have any questions, go ahead and let me know in, in the thread. But otherwise, this has been Code Red Rules coming to you uh, from GrindRule.com, and good luck at the tables.